Thank you, everyone, for being here. For those of you that are online, we have a great crowd here at 930 Britain Avenue, our newest site at NBC Biolabs. People are grabbing lunches. Hopefully, those of you that are watching from home have something good to eat as well. Uh, before I introduce our uh, honored speakers for today, just a few words about NBC Biolabs. I think while we were getting this started, you saw a scroll going by that listed our partners. Um, we really want to thank all of our partners at NBC Biolabs. They help make this a, a vibrant and special place. They help pay for lunches and nice amenities. So thank you to all of our sponsors. We uh, really appreciate them. And with that, I wanted to give just a quick introduction to Big Hat, a company that got its start here at NBC Biolabs. They started, with, I think, just the two of you and have now grown to many people. Uh, they outgrew our space, raised over $25 million from great venture capitalists like 8VC and Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, I'll turn the mic over to them really briefly just to embarrass them a bit. Uh, Mark DePristo has a degree from Cambridge University. He had, had previously had leadership roles at the Broad Institute as well as Google Brain. Uh, apparently his uh, research has been cited by over 72,000 uh, uh, other references. I have a few publications of my own and they're nowhere near that, so I, uh, that, is, that is an awesome statistic. And then uh, Peyton is really expert in all things machine learning, deep learning, AI. Basically, if it comes to teaching a computer anything, Peyton is uh, the person to do that. She holds uh, advanced degrees from Stanford and Harvard. And with that, I'll stop boring you and turn the floor over to Big Hat. They're going to tell you about their startup journey, their really impressive science. And then I think what we all want to hear is sort of lessons learned along the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's excellent. Let me see if I can get the slides. Is this visible to everyone? All right, great. So yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak at MDC today. Um, ask you to start my video. Uh, later. <laughs> later? Yeah, we'll, we'll run the video later. Okay, great. Um, oh, so well, so, yeah, sorry, Mark, can, if you're doing yeah, slides, can you share your screen? After our two year journey at NBC, you know, we did in fact found the company and basically move right in. Um, so we moved here, what, September 2019, right at the end and we, we got our funding in October. And it's really been a pleasure to be here. So it's great to tell you the story we've had over the last two years and we'll probably take about 30 minutes to get through that. And then we have a bunch of advice, unsolicited or semi-solicited <laughs> advice. You did come here, so we hope that you're interested in our advice. Um, on things that we did well, things that we would have done differently, and, and, and in between. So, and then, of course, we'll open it up to Q&A. So with that, let, let me sort of paint the picture of, of who we are and what we're doing. So um, really, the, the start of Big Hat is to really understand that we're an antibody therapeutics company. Antibodies are a huge deal. Uh, they're incredibly valuable. They're selling you know, hundreds of billions of dollars every year. And that's because they have transformed the treatments of, of all sorts of previously intractable diseases. Um, I love this poster. This is actually pre-FDA. Could you share your screen? Oh, I should share my screen. Good. Now you should share. Reshare? It is, okay. Let me how like, nope. On, your Zoom. On my Zoom, Zoom yep. I will go screen. share. And perfect. Back and good. All right. Here we go. Hold on. Hide the floating thing. Okay. Great. Okay. So where where are we? Yes. We're saying antibody therapeutics are super important um, because they are transformative for all sorts of difficult diseases. I actually love this poster that I found trying to explain, you know, the history of these drugs. You know, this is pre-FDA where we had public service announcements was the only way to sort of warn people about what drugs worked and didn't work. And less than a hundred years ago, the only treatments for cancer that were advertised were x-rays, radium, and surgery. So, you know, this is pre-chemotherapy, pre-targeted biologics. So, you know, this is a nightmare scenario if you have to go back and get cancer treatments of this form. And so because these antibodies have been so transformative in this treatment of, for instance, cancer or immune disease, 
we have an enormous amount of the top selling drugs appearing as this sort of class of, of therapeutics. You know, what is it, seven or eight of the top 10, depending on the year you look. But, you know, despite their success, we've really come to appreciate that um, the original antibodies that started to appear and really are the ones that are on that top selling list are things that came about in the initial wave of, of monoclonal antibodies that sort of started in the 80s and 90s. And there's, although they're, you know, enormously impactful therapeutics, it was pretty clear pretty quickly that a whole bunch of challenges would remain because the antibody molecule itself. And that's in part because the molecules are so big. So you have things like VHHs or SCFVs, which are sort of fragments of antibodies or, or light versions from just camels, um, appearing and really focusing on getting into the small crevices that you can't get to with such a big molecule like a MAB. And then things that are also more general than that. You know, monoclonal antibodies are particularly good at sticking to one thing, and that's pretty much their, their whole business then beyond activating the immune system. So if you want to bind multiple things together, if you want to glue multiple molecules or cells together, you, know, you want to create things like bites or bispecific antibodies, and that you know, has been opening up huge swaths of, of cancer therapies for, say, more specificity or so-called immune activator drugs, all the way to the extreme that you, know, you can really get fixated on, the, on souping up your antibody to the point that you replace the back end of the molecule with a whole cell, which is really what a CAR T therapy is. It's an antibody whose back is, a, is the cell, not a, the standard FC domain. And so this just collectively, these whole host of different antibody formats have sort of arisen out of the last you know, 20 years to address all sorts of new mechanism of action, novel therapeutic uh, opportunities. Um, but at the same time, we've come to appreciate that designing these things is incredibly difficult. So although monoclonal antibodies in general, because they are coming out of uh, say a mouse or human blood, uh, actually turn out to be pretty good molecules out of the box. So you can sort of go to a standard provider, they'll give you back a monoclonal antibody that might be very tight binder, and it's gonna express really reasonably well, and it's gonna have pretty high stability. But if you wanna make these next generation things, which are just much more human engineered, you have a lot more decision making in the process of what you're gonna do and how you're gonna build it, um, unless you're careful, you don't get anything like those that level of quality in the molecule. And we represent this down here as like low stability or low yield. You hear people complaining about this all the time. They have a bispecific, but they can't get it to produce. It's immunogenic, it falls apart. It's got all sorts of different modalities. You can't purify it correctly. And if you ignore those things, as some people have done, uh, you go right in and you experience you know, things like immunogenic reactions in humans. You can't manufacture it. You could actually have a situation where your cost of goods sold is higher than the actual cost of the drug because you can't manufacture it efficiently. And so we've seen, you know, you think about it as monoclonal antibodies of this super mature technology, it's pretty straightforward to create them. But as soon as you get into the more challenging things, which give you all sorts of additional flexibility and access to new kind of mechanism of action, you now run straight into this challenge of designing higher quality molecules. And unfortunately, there really isn't a great way to address that issue, or we wouldn't have many people piling up with these sort of semi high quality molecules floating around. And so Big Hat originated with this idea that that was an area we could focus on, that we could develop com complementary technology to the traditional sort of display and, and, and immunization discovery approaches that help us solve that design component. And the two technologies that Big Hat has is, is really developed over the last two years is one, this high speed synthetic biology based wet lab and that goes from in silico antibody designs in our cloud-based limbs. We can synthesize DNA molecules that encode that. We go in, put, produce them in cell-free protein synthesis mixes. We purify them and then we characterize them like on a battery of gold standard assays. And the purpose of this lab is to, unlike most experiments, isn't high throughput. It's medium throughput, but very high cycle time. So every week we can do a few hundred, growing to a few thousand designs. And that allows us to learn every week from the cycles of design. We can make molecules, test their properties, know what they really are, and ingest that data back in week in and week out at Big Head. 
And of course, uh, this is one of the, I just want to call out because this is a bit more about sort of the, the founding and how we went about this. This is actually one of the core principles. And in fact, um, I think one of the very first topics before we even got into antibodies when we were talking about founding is actually why is our sort of machine learning and deep learning other similar computational techniques not um, seeing the impact or the full potential that they could. And so just to put a little more color on that, I think one of the problems is you get stuck in the fixed data setting, right? You generated a big data set and you can hold out some part of that. But it's a little bit artificial. You already have the answer. You're holding out the data. You're kind of stuck in trying to optimize towards that. And so the whole kind of you know genesis of focusing on the lab to begin with, which is really where we started, was that for someone who's developing these computational methods, you need a way to validate your predictions. You need that as quickly as possible. So if you have to wait three months to know if your models are getting better, you're, you're going to be fundamentally limited. You're never going to get a few mutation, more than a few mutations away from the starter molecule. And so this is really all about how do you actually design or think about designing a wet lab from scratch that actually actively supports sort of these machine learning cycles. And that's very different from just sort of saying, you know, you'll plug in machine learning or, or analyze the data. It's, it's putting, in many ways, the computational design in the driver's seat to be able to validate predictions as quickly as possible and then iterate. So this was really actually, before we got into antibodies, the kind of the core principle around, around Big Hat that we, Mark and I, kind of discussed early on and wanted to manifest. Yes, exactly. No, I think that's, that's exactly right. I mean, that, and that frustration, this inability to sort of iterate quickly and get feedback, really limits, I, the, you know, as you were saying, the, the impact of AI in, in, in the life sciences. And so we were super excited to build this joint wet lab coupled to these design technologies. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And ultimately, the first big application of that at Big Hat is, as you might imagine from the introduction, really applying that to improve the quality of next generation antibody therapeutics. So we've been building out a team to do this. You know, one of the biggest challenges, I mean, I would say early on and in ongoing, although I would say we're, we're sort of getting a handle on that these days, now that we're at 25 people, is just putting together the inter, an interdisciplinary team that has this sort of breadth of experience. You know, we're, we have a cutting edge synthetic biology wet lab through AI ML technologies, and then we're a drug developer. So we need to have a, a shockingly broad set of expertise in the company both full-time advisors, consultants, and so we've, we've really had the pleasure of recruiting a world-class team in both advisors, you know, board members, and, and, and of course, uh, our own FTEs. And that's allowed us to attract some top-tier investors. You know, our, our seed round was led by APC and followed AMI Cloud Ventures and Innovation Endeavors. Our Series A was led by Andreessen Horowitz, and uh, that happened in January of this year. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's a little bit of a, a deeper dive into the technology, and this will be a good bit where we can kind of bounce around a little bit in the conversation. So the way to understand this slide is really the fundamentals of what Big Hat does. You could think about it in principle, it'd be better if this, this if you could come off the slide and see what you go around this loop over and over and over through many cycles. And so what you would do is start on the left with say a sequence of an antibody. It could be uh, you know, something that binds SARS-CoV-2 a little bit. And what you're doing is, is really doing two things. One, we have algorithms here that predict the effects of mutations on that. You know, do, will it stabilize the antibody? Will it destabilize it? Will it increase solubility or not? And of course, there's many, many mutations you can make. We also have algorithms that look at all those possible mutations and what we think they might do and what their likely effects and scores are, and then picks a subset that we can express on our platform for real world validation. And that is also done in a smart way so that we can kind of learn in an effective way as well as exploit the models so we find good stuff. So those sequences go to the lab, they get expressed. You know, On Monday, they go into the lab. On Friday, the data comes back, sort of goes into the AIs, which have refined their view on what m mutations actually do to this molecule. And so you get a changed set of mutations you want to propose. We go back, we make those, and you go around this cycle over and over as you sort of figure out what mutations actually do to this molecule by proposing things and bouncing back. And yeah, anything, yeah and ahead. I think maybe for those of you who are interested in sort of the more um, computational machine learning side, one of the big differentiators of how we approach um, the problem of antibody design is through using active learning techniques or Bayesian optimization, uh, for those of you who are familiar with that term. Um, but the idea, as Mark was saying, is that many cases machine learning is about just getting a feed forward model, sequence to label, sequence to label, and then picking you know the best sequence that kind of maximizes that label. And that's great, but basically what that does is often keep you in a kind of constrained space around where you started. And so the way that we actually approach these design models is by trying to optimize for learning in the beginning as opposed to optimizing for the best sequence. 
If you don't have a good model, you're gonna have a terrible, you know, do a terrible job of predicting what the best sequence is. But if you sort of know where your model is poor or has high uncertainty, actually, and you have, and you have a very fast wet lab to quickly answer questions, you can actually explore sequences that are very uncertain. And the goal in the beginning is not actually to get the best sequence. So the beginning of our campaigns is not, great, I have a model built on 10 sequences, let me pick the best sequence from that model, I'm good. It's, what do I need to do to select sequences that will give me a good model? And so that actually allows really broad exploration, what much wider sort of sets of mutations than you would otherwise see. And then after several rounds of iteration that are building these models um, in this kind of exploration phase, as Mark um, described, then you can sort of exploit and say, oh, I actually do have a good model, so now I, I'm confident in kind of predicting. And so this, you know, this approach is actually only really applicable in cases where you do have a high-speed wet lab. So this is a big differentiator when you sort of see a lot of companies in, in kind of machine learning applying those to different design problems. Having this high-cycle wet lab allows us to develop and deploy methods that, ex that enable quite broad exploration and therefore finding different sequences than you would find if you sort of wait three months, you know, train a model and can kind of look in this local neighborhood. And that's a really kind of uh, key differentiator. And again, the work style kind of as, as Mark was saying, this is really um, for us to get as much data as possible about whether this antibody is better or not than, for example, the molecule we started with. So we literally want to measure everything possible, as many assays on all sorts of different biophysics, functional activity. And so, you know, it's not just one label. And this is also kind of a little bit of a differentiator. How in every single cycle do we expand the number of things, kind of this um, kind of matrix uh, sequence and assay matrix to really tell us as much as possible. And we kind of learn from all those objectives at once, model them together, and then can explore, you know, how we improve the model of each of those um, for basically improving the next design. Perfect. Which is good, good. Okay, so yes, exactly. So you can think about the, the big hat is just ultimately producing a platform, um, which I would say is, you know, version one, 1 1.5 is live uh, now at our San Mateo facility. And really it has a sort of relatively simple input output characteristics. One is, you know, it takes any number of sort of sequences of an antibody or a protein that you might start with. It could be an initial antibody screen from a phage display. It could be an existing antibody drug that you wish to improve or change. It could be GFP and you want to manipulate the fluorescence spectra. And you have some target protein if it's, you know, binder and some design goals, right? Like I want it to be a tighter binder. I need it to be stable because I want it to be inhalable and I need to be able to, you know, make it at reasonable concentrations. And ultimately, the platform is relatively simple. It, it attempts to find a series of mutations to that initial sequence that improve the properties and hit those design goals. So that's really what the big hat technology platform is able to do. What is exciting about this, I think from the, the generality perspective, is that the algorithms we're working with are really agnostic to, it, to what those data points actually mean. We're not leveraging, for instance, the affinity of the molecule to fish out higher affinity antibodies, which is the standard way of sort of doing display, right? It's like you're leveraging a biophysical characteristic. So you're super clever experimentally, but it only works for that property. And it only works when you can select for exactly the stickiness in some convenient way experimentally. But what happens if you need to stabilize your molecule? You have to come up with some super clever way of doing that. And what happens if you want to measure something really complicated, like how well does it actually bind a cell and inhibit the cell's growth in some complex assay that takes a week to run? Like that's not going to happen. And for 10 to the 10 random antibodies that you measure in some microfluidic cell, right? Like that doesn't, that's not a viable path. And so what you really need is something that can demonstrably learn from this limited amount of data and we've started with affinity and stability, but really the methods that Big Hat is developing are generic and could be retargeted to kind of any properties you can measure in any sort of combination. And so you could think about it as our goal is to develop a general optimization machine that we can plug in different assays. In fact, you know, the whole suite of everything you might care about for a drug and just turn this machine loose to say, give me the best possible solution. And it keeps iterating until it finds sort of the best place it can get to along all of these dimensions from the basic biophysics of binding all the way to like functional readouts on cells. And so that's really the ultimate vision of the platform. Good. So as an example of, you know, us using this, and it's actually interesting, this was work just as context was done starting March 16th, 2020, right when everything locked down uh, as COVID as COVID started, you know, Big Hat was five months old, six months, yeah, five, five months, months old. old yeah. So this is pretty uh, pretty early in our life. The the platform that we sort of talked about just two seconds ago was 
you know, semi-instantiated. It was bit, we were, we were, so we were like, okay, look, let's just try to, let's fly this plane while we were building it. You know, we knew we had already done a bunch of preliminary work on RSV uh, antivirals. So we repurposed that effort to make a SARS-CoV-2 molecule. And we did it in a very unusual way. And what I mean by that is, we started with VHH and SCV, so these are the small antibody fragments that had been discovered against SARS and MERS 15, 10 to 15 years ago. So those are related viruses. They attack a not dissimilar surface on the spike of SARS-CoV-2. So we had this idea, well, why don't we just start with high quality starter mo molecules that already, some of them have progressed to clinical evaluation against SARS and MERS. Why don't we start with those and transform them into SARS-CoV-2 antibodies following this sort of rational data-driven design? Because we can measure how well they bind to SARS-CoV-2 and we can optimize for their ability to inhibit it. So we went out to the literature and we found everything we could find that bound to SARS and MERS, which was, I don't know, a few, maybe 20, 30 molecules, screened them all on our platform to find things that would bind a little bit. And then what we did is we took a whole bunch of these starter molecules and we turned those machine learning algorithms loose on it and said, improve the affinity. But, and there's all sorts of complexity here, which I'll, I'll deconstruct in, in parts. One is this is an example optimization of one of the VHH heads of this bispecific we designed. So you can think about it starting as one X is like, that's the relative quality against SARS-CoV-2 for a SARS-CoV-1 antibody. So this thing is like a few hundred nanomolar. It's not very effective. It essentially has no inhibitory. Um, uh, yeah, well, I guess it, it can't neutralize the virus whatsoever. Um, we then optimize it for a couple of rounds on the platform to improve its affinity, bringing it kind of down to the low single digit nanomolar. So this is like a hundred fold improvement in binding. And you can see that is the blue trajectory here. But then we switch, which is sort of very exciting thing to be able to do in a very big hat-esque way of immediately switching the optimization target on the fly. So what we realized is, if you think about it, since everyone knows about SARS-CoV-2, which is make explaining big hat to everyone else like much easier. So we, you know, you don't want to actually bind to the spike. That's not actually what you care about. Like binding is, effect, is important, but what you really want to do is prevent it from interacting with ACE2 and getting into your cells. That's what the actual neutralization is. So you might stick to it super well and do okay or do great at stopping that interaction. It depends on like where you bind and how, you know, all this fine details of this very complicated dance as the thing enters the cell. So you could of course measure a proxy for that. So that's the, the so-called uh, like a sandwich ELISA or a competitive ELISA, which is our purple thing. We shift in the middle of our assay to measuring something we think is more representative of the actual therapeutic value and we realize additional optimization there. And interestingly, it doesn't improve the affinity at all. So the affinity remains where it was originally, but now you're a much more potent neutralizer. And that in fact bears out. So we did this for a whole bunch of different heads. We glued them together into a bi-specific design, which is also data-driven on the platform. And if you, if you go and measure neutralization in a BSL-3 uh, lab, which we obviously did not do at MBC, uh, <laughs> we get a very potent neutralizer that's a very interesting molecule. And so this was sort of the real first proof in our hands. And this, I think we completed in August here, at, again, at MBC, um, that this was going to work. Like you could actually just iteratively transform a molecule from something that it worked on a virus 15 years ago and turn it into a, a very potent antiviral for, for today's challenges. And, and this thing is actually, I think, really helpful to think about how Big Cat works, which is often people think about antibody engineering as one objective, which is affinity, and just maximizing that, right? I want the best binder. And in reality, like, uh, you know, the quality of an antibody is this huge multidimensional grid, right? And not everything needs to be maximized. Sometimes you actually want a medium affinity, or you, you know, you want to, for example, have an antibody that binds just well enough to maybe a small molecule to get across a membrane and then release it. Um, but you have all these different objectives, and you actually what you want to do is tune them. And there's many things that matter. And so you want to be able to pick how exactly you're improving the label or the objective, the biophysics, the function, et cetera, however you want in a given column. That's not always maximization and it's not always what you can measure with this place. So this is really like opening up the idea of like one, one thing I care about to have this whole matrix, right? In order to really handle that, you need sort of algorithms that a person can't go and say, I'm, you know, the effect of this mutation is 
what on every single part of this grid. It's just too much kind of for us to conceptualize. And this is really kind of this way of thinking about how to make an antibody into a good drug is, is really, I think, one of the reasons why we think some of these techniques are, are going to be hugely impactful for solving that kind of complex, um, what we call multi-objective problem. Yes, exactly, exactly. Oh, good, good. So this is great. We, uh, this was actually right on time. So hopefully in the next few minutes, we'll, we'll sort of finish the story of Big Hat, and then we'll have a whole bunch of things that we can sort of talk about on the, uh, the journey here. So, you know, Big Hat is an, an entity is doing two things. One um, is partner-led partnerships. So we think about this as the partner comes with the target and, and a concept of what the mechanism of action should be, and we partner everywhere from taking an antibody that's a little broken and fixing it entirely all the way to like this target is target number one in the partnership and they'll choose the target you know, in, in six months and then we'll go end to end from discovery all the way to the clinical candidate. Um, but of course we supplement those type of work with another type of therapeutic development which is really big hat led work. And this is really focused on internal understanding of what we think the frontier of possible is and really pushing ourselves out there and saying, if, if you had even more powerful design, what kind of therapeutic molecules would you like to create? And then we try to go and create and really show in a pilot or a proof of concept or, 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 or something very concrete that says, this therapeutic opportunity is possible to realize on our platform. And those are becoming our own therapeutic uh, molecules, similar to the story of SARS-CoV-2, but I would say ratcheting up the ambition enormously. So we've been, you know, growing very quickly, and it's been a really an exciting journey. And uh, you know, we, I think we we spent the summer of 2019 trying to figure out exactly what we wanted to do, what was the right, exact right sort of sharp end of the spear to move into the market. We founded in September, as I was saying, we closed our five million dollar seed round from VC in October. You know, we moved right into MBC and started building as fast as we could. You know, we already had some basic stuff working by December, February. The SARS-CoV-2 program launched right here. And then we really started to get a lot of traction on the lab moving. We were able to really show that this design was working for our SARS-CoV-2 antibody, a hugely catalytic event. And I, I just as a, a piece of advice, this NBC Golden Ticket Award we won from uh, NBC and Amgen was a super important catalyst for us. We then won the NIST. We got our chief business officer sig signaling we're going to go bigger, we're growing quickly. This led to the A round from Andreessen and then really just scaling up from there. You know, Peyton won a, a, an important Woman of Influence Award. We got our first ICML paper out. There was an important accomplishment just recently that I've redacted because it's not public. And we actually had our first annual retreat in October where we met many of our employees for the first time in person. So with that, I think we'll transition exactly on time to, uh, you know, trying to provide a little bit more advice. You know, obviously the journey of Big Hat as we described is sort of unique to us. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of things that we learned along that journey that we think would be valuable for everyone. And so I, I thought in this section, basically, we'll take our time to talk through the things that worked really well, the things that we wish we had done earlier, like they, they were valuable, but we delayed too long, and things that we would definitely try to do differently. So maybe Mark Peyton, and you want Peyton, to start. could I, I know there was a question from the audience on the scientific side. Oh, good, could good. we do that real quick yeah, and sure, then we'll get yeah. to that? All right. What, what's, um, what was the question? I'm sorry, I didn't see. Uh, what's your name, young man? remain anonymous if I could. I, hey, I, dumb question, but the difference between a um, sort of uh, evolutionary approach, biological evolutionary approach, the antibodies developed, and the ones you can develop would be the absence of path dependency. You could make two mutations at once, neither one of which are confer benefit, but together they would confer benefit. Is that the big advantage? Uh, yes and no. I guess I would say there's a couple of things. We probably both have good answers good. to this. So yeah. let's do both of us. Um, one is, I would say that the way I think about it, being an evolutionary biologist by training, it's actually what I did my postdoc in, I would think about it as what we've done is taken what you would think of as directed evolution, mm -hmm. which is a pretty standard technique mm -hmm. now, and we've broken it in half, and now we control the mutation process, and the mutational process is not random anymore, it's now AI-driven mutations. Mm -hmm. 
And instead of being forced to do physical experimental selection, which is the other problem with directed yeah. evolution, ours is data and yeah. we select that way. But, so, but don't you have the great advantage which uh, directed evolution wouldn't give you would be the absence of path dependence? In other words, combining yeah. two mutations on their own that don't confer advantage but together would? We can jump over those epistatic valleys yeah, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we can move real far. I mean, we can move, move, we can make arbitrary moves in sequence space. So, you know, we can, for instance, do things that you know are infeasible with a library. Like a lot of our stuff, we we really think about it as, you know, what's the next sequence that we would move to, no matter how far away it is. So sometimes they can be pretty far. I mean, we'll make moves that are five, six amino acids away at, at a time. No, I think that's right, and I think you know, we sort of. It's funny because we're kind of, I think there's like a little bit of a Venn diagram in many ways of kind of like what people think of as directed evolution. But I think the short story is that we can, in many ways, borrow from some of the processes of how mutations are, are generated if they're useful. But at the same time, we're not bound by that. As Mark said, we think of different ways to control how mutations and what combination, et cetera. And those are done, I would say, smartly as opposed to sort of, you know, sort of biased sampling. So it's like directly intended, not I'm going to sort of try a smattering of things and select like out. That's still kind of borrows from this principle, right? Where I'm, I have this distribution that I'm, I'm basically sort of sampling from um, in bulk and hoping that something is good versus I'm designing with my own model that I have confidence will actually be impactful. So, you know, I think maybe there's a little bit more of an analogy in early rounds of big cap, but then later, you know, we also incorporate a lot of other models and sort of labels that aren't just sort of selecting on this on this binding where you have to, as you said, go kind of one at a time and can't get to the combinatorics. We're, go ahead. At, at the beginning, did you decide to limit yourself to just one antibody format? And does that actually matter? You want to take that? Sure. So you mean the beginning of Big Hat? Yeah. So it's actually interesting. We we had originally were, I think, very interested in exploring broadly just to see where the platform had, um, I would say, sort of the biggest impact. It's interesting. From the kind of machine learning or modeling perspective, one of the best parts, I think, about how we framed kind of the platform in our, our AIML stack is, is we actually get transferability. So in many cases, for an antibody engineering campaign, you have to start over when you get a new molecule, which is that, okay, I start over, I do my sort of next rounds of design, maybe that's an alanine scan or sort of library design. We actually can transfer the models of any improvement, especially the developability, like stability, solubility, et cetera, between molecules. So there's a lot of benefit for us in keeping a lot of the kind of molecule format um, the same, so that we get maximum transferability. As we grow, and especially we've already seen this, we can transfer across. It's, it's in many ways sequence determinants, modeling sequence determinants of properties we care about. And those can transfer, but in the beginning especially, we were benefited by having a more constrained kind of similarity between early campaigns, and that, that was quite beneficial. But we're you know, expanding all the time kind of the formats we look at. Um, but in the beginning, that was one thing that we were particularly focused on, I would say, um, after our initial exploration of, let's try to get sort of the algorithms as sophisticated as possible, and that's benefited by having, you know, I would say, larger corpuses of similar molecules. But that's slowly changing the more molecules we uh, produce exactly. and expanding. Great, thanks for that interlude. Now to the lessons learned. Good, good, good. So I think you should probably talk about the advantages of the name, <laughs> why we did it. Will, okay, we'll start. Yeah. This is not the number one advantage. They're not rank ordered, actually. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, well, <laughs> um, our name. I guess I can say where it came from. But yeah. the, the uh, well, actually, I don't know. I feel like this is, no, you, you can take this one. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, I think one of the challenges we, we had when we were founding Big Hat <laughs> was we were reluctant to adopt the name that had, that was hard to pronounce, yeah. hard to remember or had multiple pronunciations. I was, uh, yeah. the first startup I was ever at was called Synaptics or SynaptiX, depending on who you asked. And this was a nightmare. Because yeah. people would be like, oh, I heard you're at Synaptics. Yeah. And you'd have introduced yourself as being at SynaptiX and they would realize the same company and it was a, a, a nightmare. So we were really focused on finding something that had real meaning, but was like accessible and easy and had an available URL, which is also a challenge. Yeah. And so oh, Peyton came up with the name Big Hat. Maybe you want to talk it about it. Was, it was pretty iterative, actually. But we, um, actually, many, in many ways, yeah. uh, Big Hat style. But um, it's funny because um, the Big Hat is actually a statistical reference, which is, for those of you who remember, kind of like F hat or estimating a function. You put a hat over sort of the F um, to say, I don't actually know what this function is, but I've estimated kind of its value. And so we we're like, oh, yeah, this is great. Like Mark and I both have computational training. We're like, this is, you know, this is what we're doing. We're basically taking models of antibodies. We're estimating their values. Like, this is awesome. And then we sort of, you know, we're talking to some of the early folks in the company. And then later we had more employees come on. And they're like, what? 
so why why is this why is this big hat again? Is this because it looks like an antibody? And we're like, oh my, oh my god, okay. So <laughs> you know we've had to sort of explain how this um, comes about, but really it's about the fact that we constantly are just estimating everything in the lab, everything about our molecules, the process, the properties of the antibodies, run it in the lab, and then reestimate kind of that function. And so it's sort of done in a big way. It's how we how we came to big hat, and it's had a lot of I think playful implications on how we run programs that are named after hats internally and. Um, kind of we, you know, uh, I think um, uh, it has a lot of different, I guess, uh, meanings. There's also the logo, which I think Mark can describe a bit more, sort of some in, or some yes. intuition there, which is which is which is fun. But um, yeah, that was actually one of the harder pieces. We spent I think three months and came up with one name that we went to our VC like, this is it, this is great. And they're like, that's like one of the most evil sounding names that I've ever heard of. <laughs> we were all excited. We're like, this is it. We we're looking at the domain name if it was available, and we had to nix that one. But um, we end up with Big Hat, which I think is a little bit differentiating, and at least people can pronounce it. <laughs> exactly, and, and I think that's huge. You know, there's nothing, that's been, I think, an endless source of value for us, that people can immediately remember the name. It's, it's just so easy. There's no, nobody gets discouraged trying to figure out who they talk to. It's like, oh, the Big Hat team, easy. Um, and we had, a, you know, just to talk through the logo, you know, this is the actual hat operator. That's what it looks like. It's a carrot. And it has, you know, we have a Gaussian distribution and an hourglass and all sorts of things hidden away in the image. So we were, we were really ultimately very happy with, uh, with the name. And, and I guess the piece of advice is names that people can easily remember and are easy to search for help a lot. So if you have that opportunity anyway, monikers, simplification, calling yourself something if your name is very long and it's short, can all really, uh, I, I was surprised with how effective yeah. that turned out to be. And uh, it, it's an easy differentiator. Um, I think the seed, yeah, so the seed rage process, I think we both agreed worked really well. Um, there were a couple, I think, takeaways there. One is we did a pretty good job of balancing talking to VCs up front without moving to the pitch and term stage. So we managed to meet everybody in this sort of neutral period of like, hey, we're getting to know VCs, we're not raising yet, Here's, we're gonna raise in August, that was always the, the plan. So we met a lot of people in July, just as safe get to know you. We're thinking about this area, what do you think? We're not ready to pitch yet, we're still exploring. And I think that helped a lot, that built a lot of momentum. It let us really get to know people without suddenly getting term sheets put in front of you that are very hard to say no to. Um, and so I think that process worked really, really well. Um, what, do we have any other? Yeah, I think also just, you know, there were some folks that Mark and I knew previously, and I think it was really, really helpful. And I think as much as you can do is to have kind of a, a friendly face on the VC side of being able to go with those early stages. And I think definitely having some kind of those prior connections was very, very helpful for us to get this kind of early feedback and ended up, I think, making the process a lot smoother. If you, if you haven't done this before and you kind of like are starting, starting sort of fresh, I think there's some nuances of like exactly like, What's the context in which you're talking? Are you raising? You know, I think that that there's like this signaling, I guess, or like you yeah. know, sort of context that maybe is is at play that is not always apparent. I think especially when people first go in and raise, and so I think being able to sort of have um, friendly faces on that side and kind of frame the, you know, we're here for feedback <laughs> explicitly, and, and being able to get that from multiple different players and, and different uh, kind of from different VCs, uh, types of VCs, I'd say, was, was very helpful. Yes, exactly. There's a f phrase that I really like for this. It's, if you ask for advice, you get money, and if you ask for money, you get advice. <laughs> so that's actually a very useful piece. Like you should really be vetting everybody before the money gets on the table. Yeah. Um, I think another piece, unless, do we have anything more no, to raise? Okay, so. um, I think we're very happy with the, the venture capitalists we have. You know, uh, one, we know both of the, the, the lead partners pretty well from you know, prior engagements and in all sorts of different contexts. So we're just very comfortable with them. They're very smart, very on top of everything. Um, and, and I think really critically, you know, we've been, I think we've really benefited and enjoyed having, having investors who led from the tech bio side as opposed to the biotech side of the world. You know, for any number of things, you know, it's just more founder friendly vision is usually found in those companies. Um, there's really, a, I think, a, a more in sense of iteration and, and enthusiasm to see sort of early results as opposed to, I think the more biotech world, you know, it's just like you're throwing these Hail Marys, you're trying to catch them. 
you, know, you hope that you don't drop them two years out after you threw it. And it, it's a very stressful environment there. I think it's very helpful to have VCs who really understand the longer term vision. I think that was what we were able to find with our investors, and especially coming from the tech bios that I totally agree, which is that they're understanding we're building a technology and then the long term, right, that manifests kind of this 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 vision of, of building a successful therapeutic and, and set of portfolio of therapeutics. But in the beginning, it is a vision, right? And I think that we, because we're mostly from a technological side ourselves, um, it was very helpful to have VCs who understood that and came from a similar background. Yeah. Huge. Um, I think another thing that you know we did really well, I think, and, and, and turned out to be super valuable was just to focus on early partnerships. Yep. Um, I think the truth of the matter, the more you in, you know, life science is difficult because the true value creation events are, are far, far in the future, right? Like you're a diagnostic, when you actually valuable, it's like the person took your test and made a different medical decision based on it. Like that's way out in the future and therapeutics are even longer. So if you're trying to invest in a company making products like that, how do you, how do you de-risk it? You know, one thing is you can invest in the people, you can invest in the, like the, the, the source of the IP, right? So you'll invest because it came out of Harvard or something like that. Um, or you can have early partner traction with entities that are world leading in your area. And that is immediately de-risking your work, right? They're like, you don't even have to really know anything about the company as long as you know that that's the biggest player in the space and they partnered with you. It just de-risked the technology and the mark and the value proposition and the product market fit enormously. It settles many questions. So although it can be painful to do partnerships, it's an enormous amount of work. That fact alone is just so valuable. It's I think it'd be worth doing them under any, it's hard to imagine circumstances where you wouldn't want that validation as quickly as you can. Yeah, and I, I also add one of the things that I think I've increasingly appreciated the more we've talked to different folks is um, having an early partner that wants to be an, a, a partner in the true sense of the word. So we, I think, actually um, very much chose to work with um, partner early that wanted to kind of help us as well, not just sort of okay, do this and come back to us, but like they understood where we were. And you know they had expertise we did not, and vice versa. And we, it was felt like a partnership. It felt like you know really we enjoyed working with them. It was like a, extremely positive on, on both sides, and kind of the people on our teams really enjoyed working together. And, and I think you know that doesn't happen equally, I guess, for every partnership. And I think having one of those great relationships early on was, was actually quite huge, and, and I think really helped us as well um, in the very early stages. So definitely think about not just sort of the you know I would say like economics of a partnership, but also are they are they a good partner? Are they a good partner for you, especially at your stage? And do they sort of see this vision and, and want to see you succeed, etc.? I think that was great for us as well. Totally. The next uh, one's a big one. <laughs> yeah, the, the culture, the document. We ended up. This is sort of a consequence of being remote first, and I think yeah. generally something we wholeheartedly stole from Amazon. To be totally frank, yeah. you know, Amazon is this very famous document-oriented pitching culture. You know, if you want to do something new, you have to write a document that explains what you're doing. You really walk it. You know, you gotta, you gotta be able to read this document, and understand what the is the, the goal of this project will be and what the outcome is. And, and as I understand, they even go so far as you have to write the press releases that will come out when your product is launched at Amazon. So you're sort of envisioning what the impact will be. And we sort of borrowed this idea that like writing would be the primary narrative, that everything at Big Hat would be captured in documents and sort of notes. And and now we have, a, we, so we really, this actually, I think we were excited that this would be impactful, but now that we're two years in and we have 25 people, it's amazing it's how huge. convenient, like you just point people at things like, do you want to know the history of business development? Like here, there it is. Like everything we've ever talked about is in a doc. You, there's just no question what happened. You know, if you want to know why everything is happening, there's a doc to do that. It's at the point now that we sort of are indexing our own documents and trying to make it clearer what goes with what projects and who's involved because basically we have a written record of every important thing that ever happened at Big Hat. And that just is so yeah. powerful. And just to give you the extreme, I think we are very kind of fixated on, on process and automation as much as possible. And this is not just kind of in the company in terms of the technology, but also our kind of corporate operations, I would say. And so this is so far as that in many ways, our project management system is all done through basically documents and logs that have been like specifically set up basically for our purposes. Instead of a project manager just writing reports manually what happened, everyone has to go in and use this log system and things are written down, toggling statuses, and they're automated. Like you can basically literally get an automated update um, and it's sort of it's not people happy. And we really think about how to scale an organization like from very early stages uh, using a lot of kind of um, tools and automation. And this is also just process. Mm -hmm. So when someone's gonna do something more than once, 
you don't just write down like what happened. You write down what's the process and by which you're doing this. And I think this is like this is like things like ordering. This is scientific. How do I basically extract these things from a database? Everything we try to document. And so when we people come in and join us, one of the things they often say is like, wow, like I could I could just get a doc and I could I could get going and I knew it, I knew where to find. I could read the history, etc. And you know, it, it's it's not always easy, right, to kind of I think enforce that type of documentation, but it almost always pays itself for it. And that's one of the things that Mark and I, I think from the very beginning have really put a lot of emphasis on and it's allowed us to be kind of remote friendly. It's allowed us to take a lot of the human effort out of some things that otherwise can bog people down to focus them on, on their own work that they exactly. uh, I think are, are most, um, yeah, that's most critical. Yeah, like a good example of this that just happened last week, our, our EA is, is, yeah. is sick, so she needed two weeks off, right? And this, we got a temporary EA. Yeah. I think within three hours of joining, she was fully operational yeah. because the there's a, a how to do everything yeah. that the that our previous EA is doing. Yeah. So it's like, how do you schedule a meeting with Mark and Peyton in person? And there's Doc saying, yeah. this is exactly how this works. Preference is Wednesday, backup yeah. is Tuesday. Yeah. Like, these are the time frames. When we say this in the email, we mean you should schedule 30 minutes, 45 minutes. It's all sort of written down. And so we literally had someone parachute in and was Functional. Immediately functional within yeah. hours. Yeah. And sort of most of Big Hat looks like that. And you know, it's painful in the beginning, <laughs> but boy, it's so convenient yeah. that you, you're basically sort of self-documenting. Yeah. Like people come in, you give people, here, you're in charge of communications at Big Hat. Here's the full doc that explains how we launched every twi Twitter, Twitter post, every LinkedIn post, exactly why it was written this way and everything is there. So that's huge. Um, yeah, it's just super fascinating how much that had an impact. Um, I think the work-life balance bit was really valuable too. So we basically, as a company, never work past six culturally. People are not doing really anything late. On the weekends, it's nobody's really working. Um, and we do that in part as a sort of forcing function for people to prioritize things. like. You can't just keep working. That's not a solution to the endless tasks. Like there's way more tasks than you could ever get done no matter how many hours you put in. So we just draw a line here and say like, if you, you've got to make priorities and things that don't make that cut, like don't get done. You can't just sort of work endlessly in an attempt to do everything. You have to prioritize. And we sort of force that and over the weekend, like we're not sending emails, we're not doing this, unless it's really an emergency, right? Like, yeah. We had someone's laptop stolen on a Friday night, and that was, you know, immediately everyone's happy to, because they're not working every Friday night. So it's like, it's actually kind of exciting. It's a big deal that you're working on Friday night. Something big happened, right? Which is, which is huge. So, you know, people I think are a little surprised by how strong this is. You know, you're getting, you're sending emails at night, people are immediately telling you, is this an emergency? Is this, you know, Slack is basically a ghost town after six. And I, find, I think everyone's wildly productive because of this, because you, there's no, there's no slack. There's no, you can't work to seven o'clock that day, right? Like you can't just goof off and then make it up by inconveniencing all your teammates because you chose to do that. Like there's a very hard line unless you very clearly can articulate why you need to be working like that. And I think it's been huge. Yeah. It's very relaxing, but, I, but it creates this like very serious, like we're here getting stuff done together. I think having lots of folks with kids, I mean, like everyone, everyone has got schedule and things, especially with, with COVID families, et cetera. And so I think just having that structure and expectation has been really helpful for everyone and having mm -hmm. people, you know, with multiple kids, I want to mark as three kids, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, being able to be productive as well. And that helps for recruiting. I mean, it really, yeah. you know, you can tell people that and they ask and it's, it's real. Um, I think the not overhyping was, it was something maybe you want to talk this about. This was something that we cared a lot about. I think that there's this danger, especially in the machine learning driven companies to promise, 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 and, and sometimes potentially under deliver. And I think people get caught up. There's reasons to do that, right? Like there's a lot of incentives to do that and, and sort of like people get pushed into that. And I think we made a very strong stance that we wanted to get everything working, sort of, I would say develop proof of principles that we were happy with before we would broadcast anything. And this goes for kind of many areas of kind of case studies, kind of our work with others, et, et cetera. And so we were very quiet in the beginning. We didn't want to tell people too much about what we were doing. We wanted to think about what would we do, at what point would we be comfortable broadcasting more of what we're doing and being more public. And I think um, that's still something that we basically have put a lot of emphasis on, not just kind of ourselves, but also with everyone um, at our company. You know, when would we actually publish paper? You know, what's the, what's the standard? What's the you know, standard sort of sharing more about kind of the platform, et cetera. And we've been quite slow about that. And, and it's been great because we can focus internally and we haven't been distracted. And we, I think originally we even like got a Twitter account and then shut it down for like a year. And like we're not yeah. gonna touch this. And, and I think we're, um, 
very deliberate in thinking about how we wanted to communicate early on what we were doing, just because it, it allows us to focus internally and hit those proof points without any um, distraction. Exactly, exactly. Like we write our, co our partnership contracts to disclose the partnership upon success of the first major event. So you see, like, that's just a very, it's very serious, right? You're not gonna just, you're not gonna capture any of the value until you actually show that you're making progress. But then when you do announce it, you're not announcing the fact that they wanted to work with you, that you've been working together and have actually successfully done something. It's a very different dynamic and it makes everyone, I think, much more comfortable that you're, you're not sort of pulling fast one, trying to get this momentum that's artificial. Um, so that was good. Do we have a, okay, so that was the things that we would recommend copying. Um, we really liked that. We thought they were very valuable. Um, there are a bunch of things that we, yeah, how do I say it? It's not all, it was not all perfect. There were many things that we decided that we, we thought we could keep kicking down the road longer than we probably should. So full-time EA was so valuable. You know, it's just, it's time back. Right? Like, and a good EA is really helping so, so much. You know, talking to people, arranging things, collecting information is just, we should have gotten, like, I'm not surprised that every time you hear people who are serial founders, like, an EA is often their first hire. Just to get the machinery of functioning as a company up and running. Um, head of people, you want to talk yeah. about? Anything? Yeah, no, I think this was definitely huge for us. I, mean, I think many of you probably know that it, you know, people are basically in many ways what makes your company, right, besides the technology. And I think that's uh, something we invest huge amounts of time in is recruiting and, and talking to candidates and, and making sure we're building the team well. And, there's, there's no way around it. It's a huge amount of time, right? And I think having someone who's really good at that, who's focused on making sure that candidates have good experiences, that people in the company are having, you know, a positive experience, want to keep working, are coming and excited every day. I mean, this is this is like not a, you know, a, a task to ignore until later, right? And so I think that we, you know, Mark and I basically did a lot of this, a lot of this ourselves, and and you know, really in hindsight, <laughs> we're like, should have brought this person in a lot earlier. So, yes. um, you know, and it may seem like okay, this is not the core science, et cetera, but it's, it's one of the most critical parts of, of building the company. And so I think we would have done that probably a whole year earlier um, uh, at this point and definitely recommend thinking about that. Yes. And then the other side, I think, is similar to the head of people in EA is, again, just corporate operations yeah. in general. Like, how do, you, how do you do basic stuff? Like, I want to order something. How does that work at your company? Like, how do you avoid the nightmare scenario of everyone doing everything differently every time? Because the overhead, when it's just the two of you, it's no big deal. Whatever, you, you know, we'll yeah. just order some stuff. Yeah. But like, you know, now that we're way in, you know, you don't want to have to create these enormous systems under the gun because everyone is doing everything totally differently, and it's a problem. You need to sort of create the corporate rails that let everyone scale up. Actually, shockingly early. The more they're there is, is valuable. You can think about it as sort of the flip side of our document-oriented culture. We're obsessed with writing the process down, but then we would have things that, we would, that were sort of outside of that scope. We wouldn't really turn it into a process, and many of those things we wish we had yeah. processized earlier because it's just easier to be able to do it. Um, okay, then things that we would definitely recommend doing differently. Um, we got preempted on our Series A, so this was very exciting. What that means is basically Andreessen and, and us were talking, and they basically said, you, you want to raise with us. And you know, it was obviously extremely flattering. We, they're a phenomenal company. We like the partner. There, there's no negative thing about them, except for the fact that we never really went out to the market. Right? You never really know what you could have gotten at that moment. And I don't think we're unhappy at all with what we got. But there's always this open question of like, what would you have gotten had you been on the market? And, and like, you can never escape that. And so the preemption, these early term sheets that can come in are very attractive, but I can see why people provide the advice of like, if you're not raising, don't raise. And if you're gonna raise, you've gotta raise. And like, you can't have this fuzzy, like we're thinking about raising. Like if you're thinking about raising, that means that like some aggressive VC can come in and like convince you that they're the right partner, because they might be. They might be the right partner and they might be giving you the right terms. And it could all be streamlined except for the fact that you don't ever really know. And that is just hard. And in retrospect, I think, although we love Andreessen, we were very happy to get preempted. I think that dynamic is hard and you can sort of never really overcome it. 
So I, I think, yeah, how do I say it? Maybe the best answer is like maybe do one preemption to learn and <laughs> do get you know do the all all the others. Um, partnership structure is another thing. This is complicated. How you organize your partnerships is very very complicated. And I think in retrospect. I wish we were much more sophisticated before we really started to do that. So it's great to partner early, but then you gotta find someone who really knows the structure of partnership deals really well. So maybe another way of thinking about this is I wish we had our chief business officer earlier. We would have probably gotten further, faster, and more smoothly if we had had that level of sort of expertise in-house. <laughs> Even more corporate ops, yes, exactly. Even more corporate ops. Everything just, the less people have to think about anything that's not critically important for the company, better to have be centralized and operationalized and just be taken care of. And I wish we had done more of that. I still wish more of Big Hat was centralized. That's, that's gonna be an ongoing one for us, I think, indefinitely. But exactly. It's always hindsight. Perfect, so we have four minutes for Open Q&A. <laughs> yeah, not, not surprising. A company that's so focused on uh, process got this presentation down to the minute. If there is a question, we do have time for one question from the audience. Oh, yeah, we got one in the back. All right. Uh, you talked about the document culture. And my question is that uh, how do you balance that, which is a great thing, with not getting bogged down, not getting things slowed down by requiring all sorts of documentation. Coming from an engineering background, getting to do the experiment early and uh, getting some quick results sometimes is really important. Yeah. It's a good question. And I think one of the ways we, we try to address that, which is that if the goal is just like write everything down, you're kind of like, well, that's a lot, right? Writing, everything I'm, writing down everything I'm doing is going to take longer sometimes than doing it. We actually try to um, provide structure that makes it very efficient. So if you're just like, great, write everything down, that's very different from saying, literally, here's the structure of how we log all of our work. This is what an experiment does. This is what, a, this is what it means to take meeting notes. Like, you have to write the goal. This is like not more than three sentences. It's extremely structured, such that you don't have to, you don't have to make a template. You don't have to basically like, put the sections. Like, it's all there. And in fact, if it's the same project, you can populate what the project's about. And then just sort of fill in like, what this experiment is. And so we basically put all the framework in place such that the documentation is basically the, the short amount of time. And I would say, if you're doing anything that's gonna take more than you know, like an hour, like you, you can take two minutes to write down what you're doing and why in a few sentences. I think people, it feels like a burden in many ways, but if you, if you streamline it, and you know, here's the structure, you get good at it, like this is what I have to do. Every time I, I am gonna do an experiment, I should know why. Like what, what, is the, what is the outcome? Like what's the action, what's this heading towards? If I can't articulate that in five sentences, you should probably think about that. So we kind of just very actively enforce that. And, make it as easy as possible. We have, you know, basically like sort of someone whose entire job in many ways is just making sure that that runs smoothly and that it's structured, it's clear, et cetera. And, and we're always evolving. It's always becoming coming better, but structure really helps, especially where there's a, a big many to kind of put a lot of effort in that. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, a good rule of thumb is like, if you find yourself writing a complex email, it should be a document. Like if it, you know, yeah. yeah. explain the context, like put it, it's, you know, and let people see it in the future. Why is the only, why are the only people who get to appreciate your deep thoughts about like how we should do some new thing? Only the people you chose to email at that moment, right? Like put it in a document that's in some bigger doc like corporate ops or like the future of HR and then just email a link to that thing and they can comment in the Google doc and that's captured and if you edit it, it's captured. And then you have forever kind of the canonical source of truth on this is what we do. And so it's really, you could think about it as like Slack is perfect for just, I need immediate feedback. Emails are good for like slow things. And then things that are permanent, things that are like need to be reused or things that somebody else could conceivably need to know in the future all go into docs and you just link into them. And we're pretty, I we're pretty, we're pretty aggressive about this, but I think in a good way, in the sense, someone's like, oh, can you review this? And it's not in a doc, it's like, you know, the, the, the way you do it is literally just put a link in the doc. If you're on Slack and you're sending text and it's not elsewhere, it's like, you, you basically like it's, it's just the muscle and I think once you have the muscle it's actually it's really not that high of a burden you're gonna write it anyway you just open the doc there's already a place for it and then you link to it and so it's just creating that kind of cultural muscle in the beginning it's kind of like oh, okay like how much do you enforce that but I think when you enforce that it's actually, actually easier for everybody because they just understand what the protocol is and so we put a lot of effort into doing that yeah Peyton and Mark thank you so much thank you, thank you for coming back to NBC Biolabs Anytime. and sharing your story <laughs> sure. thanks for getting your start with us and then 
For those of you who have joined on the webinar uh, elsewhere who may not be familiar with NBC Biolabs, we try to help great entrepreneurs like Peyton and Mark get their start. We do that by renting one bench at a time. Remarkably, we've helped over 230 companies. They've raised more than $10 billion, and we do that uh, really in the service of entrepreneurs. So thank you all for coming. Thank you again to Big Hat. Thank you. It was really a pleasure. Total pleasure. Great to, I mean